Hi, and welcome to another episode of InstaVision. I'm Glenn Reynolds. Well, it's a special American Success Story episode of InstaVision. Uh, just a few years ago, gasoline prices were skyrocketing, uh, U.S. oil supplies were shrinking, uh, we're making a desperate Hail Mary pass for alternative energy, uh, but now oil and gas are comparatively cheap and plentiful, which is a good thing because that alternative energy stuff didn't work out so well. Uh, and it's all because of fracking and horizontal drilling and some technological innovations that were pioneered here. Uh, our guest is Gregory Zuckerman. He's a Wall Street Journal reporter, and he's the author of The Frackers, the outrageous inside story of the new billionaire wildcatters. Welcome, Gregory. Great to be here. So we went from being ever more addicted to imported energy to being the world's largest producer, actually, in just a few years. How, how did that happen? Yeah, it's remarkable, the shift. Um, it's mostly to, due to American uh, innovation, uh, persistence, and resilience. So there were a few determined Americans, uh, mid-size uh, energy producers, who weren't the Exxons of the world, weren't the Chevrons in the world. They believed in America, and they believed in their ability to tap shale. So shale is this uh, narrow, long layer of rock well below the surface, as much as 14,000 feet below the surface. And these guys figured out how to both frack uh, and horizontal drill this layer, and it and led to all kinds of uh, natural gas and energy and oil production. Yeah, and a lot of it was really sort of serendipitous, wasn't it? That's how it started, yes. Yeah. So, um, well, it was some of that and a lot of hard work. So basically, there's a guy named George Mitchell who ran a mid-sized energy company out of Houston, and they had some acreage in Texas, and they were running out of uh, natural gas. They had these commitments to sell to places like Chicago. They were responsible for about 10% of all natural gas going to Chicago. And they could see the writing on the wall. They were running out of natural gas. And unlike the Exxons and the Chevrons of the world, they didn't have offshore places to drill, Africa, Asia, et cetera. So they did have the shale in Texas, and Mitchell told his guys, this is our last chance, we're running out of gas. Uh, by the late 90s, they still haven't figured it out, but um, there's a guy named Nick Steinsberger, and with some good luck, they um, realized that they stumbled into the right fracking solution, the, the right cocktail, which was full of a lot of water, and it was a mistake, and I write about it in the book, and it helped them, and they realized that this mistake actually led to all kinds of good production, and then they tweaked it, and they worked on it, and they took it from there. Now, what, what interesting thing about your book is, despite these cool graphics we're displaying, the book's really more about people than it is about technology. Uh, but why was it American people and, and not, say, Chinese people who made this breakthrough? It's a really good question. And yeah, my book really is about the individuals, the colorful characters. And I sort of set out, OK, we know there's a resurgence of production in this country. How did it happen? And who are the people behind it? And that's sort of what I write about. And yeah, it should have happened somewhere else, uh, China, Russia. Argentina, Mexico, they all have as much shale, oil and gas, if not more. But there's something unique to America. There's a lot of things that are unique to America. We've got infrastructure here. We have capital markets. We have capitalism. Frankly, uh, you, you need a desire, a strong desire, to be rich and famous or, or, or maybe um, want to make a dent, make, make yourself uh, well known and have an impact on your country. And you have a lot of that ingenuity and um, capitalist spirit in America. Uh, you also have in America property property rights. You own the mineral rights under your home, generally speaking, and you don't have that abroad usually. And as a result, the entrepreneurs that I write about were able to cut deals with landowners so they could lease their land and get going and produce uh, oil and gas. Uh, it's really interesting because uh, for all the talk we hear about the 1% and all of this, uh, these are not the big guys. Uh, you know, of course, Harold Hamm started out literally as a sharecropper kid who had to miss school to pick cotton. Uh, wound up being worth $14 billion or something like that. And there are a bunch of these rags to riches stories, which are interesting because pretty much all the smart money actually missed this development. People like Warren Buffett or Henry Kravis or even Peter Thiel. That's exactly right. So all the experts were sure we were running out of oil and gas in this country. And we're talking about just a few years ago. Everybody from Exxon and Chevron, I write about how Chevron had a group 
that was going to try to tr drill in these kind of places called unconventional drilling, and they gave up on it. And they, uh, the guys that were working on it, they, uh, people at, at Chevron made fun of them, undermined them, and they finally just gave up. And it was sort of these unusual people, unexpected people. Harold Hammond didn't go to college. Aubrey McClendon and Tom Ward, who were not experts in drilling or engineering or geology, never took courses like that. They were landmen. There's a guy named Sharif Suki, an immigrant from Lebanon. There are actually a lot of immigrants and a lot of older people uh, in my book and at the forefront of this revolution. So it took sort of a, a stubbornness and unusual character, a self-confidence, uh, and someone or, or a type of person who ignores the conventional wisdom. It took that to make this revolution happen, I would argue. It's actually immigrants and older people as opposed to smart hipsters who went to Harvard. Well, one interesting thing is your fracking has really changed our national security picture a lot. And it's also led to a, actually a major drop in America's carbon emissions. We're actually, I think, the only nation to reach the Kyoto targets, even though we didn't sign Kyoto. Uh, were any of your wildcatters actually interested in these kind of results, or were they just interested in making money? It is fascinating. It's a good point. We, our carbon dioxide emissions are down about 12 percent since 2005, and it's partly because the economy has slowed, but it's also largely because we've shifted away from coal um, towards natural gas because natural gas is so cheap. Um, I'd say some of the people I, was, I, I dealt with and at the forefront of this revolution cared about the environment. Um, more of them just wanted to be rich and famous and to have an impact. They did talk a lot more about, about uh, energy independence, and it sounds corny, but a lot of them internally, they really believed it. They talked to their people. They say, hey, America really can become energy independent. Um, as opposed, as, as far as the environment, George Mitchell, who's the father of all this, he believed in alternatives. He just believed that this can be a transition, as do I. This can allow us, as a people, time to figure out how to, how to use, how to get solar and um, wind uh, to the point where we can rely on it more. But we're not there yet, so um, let's take advantage of this, this resource we have. You know, it is really interesting because, of course, energy independence was U.S. government policy for the last 40 years, and we've had a variety of programs designed to achieve it. Uh, but when it actually comes, it comes from a bunch of old people and immigrants that nobody ever heard of. Uh, well, are there lessons in this story that might apply to other industries or areas? Yeah, I do think so. And in, regarding your point, it's a really good one that, um, you know, uh, President Bush was an oil man, and he, a few years ago, kind of said, hey, we need to do things like uh, ethanol, and he was given up on U.S. oil. And it happened under President Obama, not that he necessarily encouraged it, but it is ironic and interesting as to how it happens. And there are really good business lessons because um, the innovation comes over time, and, and people want kind of these eureka moments, and people want uh, the government to be responsible, and everyone kind of depends on the government. And it's my, it's my view that um, the free markets and financial markets provide remarkable incentive for people to make innovation. If you look at electric cars and Elon Musk and the billions that he's made and in the fracking story, in my story, these people uh, wanted to make history. They wanted to make an, 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 a dent uh, and, and improve our situation geopolitically. Uh, and they also wanted to become um, rich. And that those incentives, the free market incentives, I believe, are much better at allocating resources than um, governments. You know, Solyndra didn't really work out. But I think we will make the, that kind of progress when it comes to solar and wind, but it'll be the entrepreneurs and they'll be the capitalists. I mean, I talk to Wall Street people, private equity people, and they really do want to make uh, a revolution in alternatives. It'll just take time. So just like it took 18 years for Mitchell's guys, and I write about this in the book, to, to make this innovation and the breakthrough when it comes to drilling for shale in, the, in, in Texas, in the Barnett Shale area, it's going to take a while. Um, business innovation comes um, um, over time. There aren't many eureka moments. Well, it's really interesting to see, and it's certainly a contrast to talk about this revolution uh, as we see Washington stumbling over the health care reform uh, and the website that doesn't work and everything else that doesn't work. It's nice to see that there still is an America that does work. And thanks for coming to talk about it. Yeah, sure. It was uh, kind of refreshing to, for me to see as well in some ways that reassured me about our uh, country and its future. Thanks so much. My guest has been Gregory Zuckerman. He's the author of Frackers, the outrageous inside story of the new billionaire Wildcatters. And thank you for coming in and joining us. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, have fun on the Internet.